Hello and welcome. I'm here today with Dr. Paula Olszewski and Paula has just been inducted into our Stoughton High School Hall of Fame for Extraordinary Achievement. Welcome, Paula. Thank you, Dr. Rizzi. It's an honor to be here today. It's really um, a very emotional day for me and I'm so happy to be back. I, I love my time in Stoughton and it's just wonderful to come back. Well, thank you for coming. Uh, so, Paula has a very long list of achievements. They include scientist, feminist, fundraiser, and as we tell our students now all the time, the uh, chances of you having one profession in your life um, are very slim these days. You're very likely to have two, three, four, even five professions over the course of your professional life, some of which you won't even envision uh, when you start out. And I think that your life may have paralleled that track a little bit. I and never dreamed of the career that I have today. and. When I was studying chemistry at Stoughton High, again, I studied it because I loved it. I studied, and again, I studied chemistry at Yale and at MIT, and it was just, I loved it. I loved the discipline. But did I realize that that training, as well as other experiences, would lead me to become a foundation officer where I fund scientific research? It's like extraordinary. I didn't even know my job existed, and yet it, it's wonderful. I, I can't believe I get paid to do the work that I do. Now we have uh, the last census tells us um, that the adults in Stoughton, um, ha there are only about 20 percent, 28 percent of our adult population that has college degrees. And yet the students that are in Stoughton High now, um, we know will do much better um, in life in terms of what they'll be able to earn and so forth if they do have college degrees. So um, it certainly changed the options that you have if you do or don't go to school. Uh, after you leave here. Um, could you kind of tell us how you got from Stoughton High School to Yale and then MIT because that's uh, certainly a couple of very elite colleges and some people might be a little intimidated um, at the possibility of, of being able to go to a place like that. Well, again, I, I, I didn't know enough to dream to go to Yale or MIT, but I Again, I had, came from a family that was, you know, again, not educated but loving. We didn't have money, but we, we seemed to, you know, we had each other. And my parents encouraged me to be my best. They could see that I love science from an early age. They gave me chemistry sets and microscopes and so on. But it was really uh, the teachers at Stoughton High School who really, really helped me. And I'll start with Miss French. She was a social studies teacher. She was a tough teacher in what was then called junior high, now middle school. You know, oh, I survived her. I mean, I got A's, but oh, it was tough. And then I get to Stoughton High, and she's my teacher again. It was, but again, I, I look back on my days with Miss French, and she really, you know, demanded excellence from me, and that was really helpful. Mr. Holbert was my chemistry teacher, and he nurtured my interest in chemistry. His, his um, work in the classroom was very interesting, but we spent a lot of time doing lab work, and I still have very fond memories of working in the lab with the lab partner, you know, the, the experiment work, or it, it did not work, and so on. And then the third teacher I want to mention is a teacher who was only here for one year. It was Mr. Moulton. He graduated early from Harvard, somehow became an English teacher at Stoughton High, and he saw something in me. And so when, I guess when my SAT scores came, he's like, oh, Paula, we've, we've got to get your score, we've got to get your verbal scores up. I was like off the charts in terms of anything science and math, but we won't say what my verbal scores were. But he started giving me vocabulary words, so I, like to study, and lo and behold, my scores went up 100 points, and I think even maybe 130 points. So that was, that was very important. But he, he did something else, and he introduced me and my family to uh, Yale University. Yale had just gone co-ed a couple years before, and I had no idea that schools had a need-blind admissions, need-based aid. So Mr. Moulton sent me and my parents, and again, my parents were not educated, but they were loving. Okay, we, I still remember we got all dressed up. We drove into Boston and heard, uh, you know, we were room filled with parents and children, and we heard these talks. And I became so excited. It's like, it would be my dream to go to Yale. And my parents w were very happy because they never 
we never did anything we couldn't afford. And so it was such a relief to them that if I went, if I got in there, that I could go there. And that was really quite remarkable. So there I was, the third entering class of women at Yale. It was a wonderful experience. Um, I, I, I studied a lot of chemistry. I met my husband there. I made very good friends there. But, it, but coming from Stoughton High School, um, I, I felt I was, my education was good, but I was somewhat intimidated, and we had all, but my right. guidance counselor, Mr. O'Leary, before I was leaving, said, oh, don't worry, Paula, sure, half the kids will be smarter, but you'll be ha smarter than the rest. So the fact yeah. that, that, he oh. saw, that my guidance counselor said you'll be in the middle was somewhat reassuring. Yeah. So anyway, uh, again, and I, I, I did very well. Um, you know, I had some problems in some classes, but again, you know, I found my way. I, I had uh, professors in chemistry who helped me along, and I did research, and they helped me get summer jobs because I needed to work. I mean, I didn't, you know, I needed, right. and even with financial aid, you still need to, to work. But that all, you know, again, contributed to my education. I, it mm -hmm. wasn't like I was back at Marshall's, you know, at the service desk doing, processing layaway returns. So, you know, that was really good. But when I went, just before I left Yale and was going to MIT, I asked my professors for some advice, you know, all excited. And my professors helped me a lot. They told me which labs did not take women. Mm. And I said, thank you. So that was good. I would know what labs not to be interested in. Right. And um, now when I think of it, that's terrible. Um, on the other hand, it's, har it's, it's hard work um, getting a PhD. And I wanted to make sure I was in a lab where I wasn't pen you know, right, you deliberately penalized for being a woman. So anyway, yeah. so I, I chose wisely and I, I had a very positive experience. As, um, and we still look at different professions and see that some still don't have an equal representation of women. I'm wondering if you compare when you first went into science, um, so as an undergraduate and then as a graduate student, uh, can you compare that to what you see now? All right. So as there have been a, representation. a lot of advances, and so if we take my field in chemistry, the pipeline is filling. It, again, I want to say when I was uh, graduating from Yale, there were 20 chemistry majors, uh, four women, so mm, not too okay. many. Um, I was the, I may have been the first Yale female undergraduate to get a PhD in chemistry, but I'm not exactly sure. But I, I. There weren't mm -hmm. that many women up there. Yeah. But anyway, um, and the, so I look at the pipeline now, at a lot of schools, the um, chemistry major, more than half the chemistry majors are women. So that's good. At, when I went to MIT, there were 50 students in my entering cohort. It's not like we were a class, because you, there are five different types of chemistry you could be studying. And right. now I think the percentages are much higher, at least a third. You get to the faculty, um, it's a problem. And the, I, so I graduated from MIT in 1979 and somehow was appointed to the MIT Chemistry Visiting Committee 15 years later. Oh, okay. So I was somewhat intimidated. It's like, I'm, so these are professors who, you know, were winning Nobel Prizes and whatever, <laughs> suddenly I'm on the review committee. And they, at MIT, they present lots of data. And so I'm looking at the data, and I'm listening to the talk. And I said to them, you mean to tell me that 15 years later, you've been graduating at least 10 women a year with a PhD in chemistry from MIT. So that's at least 150 women. And you still only have two women on the faculty? Mm. What is wrong here? Are yeah. these 150 graduates? At, women graduates, are any of them not good enough to come here? Mm -hmm. And if that's true, then are you not training them properly? Mm -hmm. Or is there some top? So I was very outspoken. And Pete, I, that's the tip of the iceberg. Um, in 2000, uh, MIT then ultimately did the co-ed, the chemistry department went co-ed. I think it's at least 20% women now. Um, and I got, an award, and it doesn't say, the award, I got a bronze beaver. It's the highest award, <laughs> don't you love oh, the name? Yeah. It's the uh, highest award you can get as an MIT alumnus. But I really think I, they say I got it for being doing all of these sort of bland things, but I think I got it for making the chemistry department faculty go yeah. co-ed. And I still keep an eye on it. I'm no longer on the visiting committee. But mm -hmm. I, again, it's, it's very important. And, and I really just, um, you know, I, I see it, um, that particularly in sort of a lot of these 
development of games and coding is still is hostile to women. So fortunately, I work at a philanthropic foundation, and you can start to address things. So um, you know, we we overall not through, I don't run the program, but other people, another program officer runs sort of. Um, uh, our program for underrepresented groups, which is women and minorities, uh -huh. trying to make sure that they had a fair chance yeah. and uh, flourish. And uh, but it's also the way I live, okay, just sort of. And so it's so um, you know if you so if you look at my grantees, I have women and minorities in mm -hmm. my okay. It's just like I it doesn't matter. People I have people you know I have gay people. I mean I have a I have great set of grantees, mm -hmm. but it's not all white guys. And the population of America isn't it's not, all white guys exactly, anymore. Exactly, exactly. So if you look at the percentage of the population that is either female or minority, and you exclude them from those kinds of positions in the world, then you're not tapping into a huge, huge talent pool. Exactly, exactly. And that's, that's not good. And there are other studies that show um, that um, companies that have boards, that have women, diverse boards, that mm -hmm. have women and minorities, make more money. And oh. um, it's this is like a, one of my latest, you know, I, out of the goodness of my heart projects. Not, but again, trying to work with um, a number of people I know and some of the people at MIT on like addressing these issues. So if you look at the faculty at MIT in biology, do those women have the same opportunities to participate on scientific advisory boards mm -hmm. as the men do? I haven't seen the data, but if you look at the data, publicly available data of companies started by MIT professors uh, um, in the life sciences, where, where there are lots of life science professors, um, out of a, if you add up all the people on the boards, there are like three women. I mm -hmm. think there's a problem. So anyway, in my free time, I yeah. worry about that, and I, and you know, again, part of it is helping younger people, encouraging them, and others. You know, some of these women, um, it's like we're still fighting this, but we have to. We have a very large percentage of our science faculty as women here, and a large percentage of our math faculty. And um, it's very, it's, it's easy to say to girls, you're, you can be as good at this as boys. And of course, that is true. Right. But I think for them to see that it's women who are teaching them chemistry and physics, um, especially at the highest levels, that, that oh, it helps modeling to see people that doing is really things. helpful. Right. Yeah. As opposed to saying, gee, can I do this? Right, because I don't see anybody doing it. Right. Yeah. So how did you get from um, a PhD in chemistry through to um, working in a philanthropic foundation? A very interesting pathway, one which I would not have designed. But I realized there was a, a common theme. And I've always been a people person, and I always l mm love the science and I'm well trained and so if I look at my career my I've always been at the interface between the science and some other group so okay. for example when yeah. I worked at the biotech company I had to work with the scientists to get some of the products through the regulatory affairs mm -hmm. uh, so I didn't know anything about I was open to regulatory affairs okay. and learning how to you know do that type of work so again you're it's almost like you're, I was almost like a scientific translator throughout my career so um, you know I, I when I worked in the biotech industry, again, working with scientists, but like working with patent attorneys. So always at the interface. And when I had an opportunity to go with a startup company in Boston, but I chose not to go. My husband had just gotten a big promotion. We had two young children. And, um, but then it got me thinking, what did I want to do? So, I yeah. so the biotech company I was working for was relocating to Long Island. I just, I just couldn't do it. It just would not be fair to my family or to me to be commuting 50 miles each way. Mm -hmm. So I entered an entrepreneurial phase. I tried starting some companies. It was a big failure. But that, you know, you learn from learn failure. Things. Right. And, but I developed a very nice consulting practice. And again, I, you know, basically at the interface between science and something else. I did technology um, transfer, you know, basically, um, Scientists and engineers were coming up with new inventions, and I would then license them to companies to commercialize them. Um, but I was also running a program funded by New York State to build bridges between companies and universities. And it's so important. And I was a matchmaker. I did not have money. And so I would say, meet scientists, meet the company people, and say, oh, did you know that Professor so and so was doing really interesting work. I think it might be helpful for your company. And the mm. the measure for success 
was that the company and the faculty member wrote a, um, wrote a grant to the federal government. A, certain, a very small percentage of the federal grant money is from these SBIRs and STTR grants to, to commercialize things. So as long as they you know, got some, then I, our tax dollars were being well spent in right. New York. Yeah. So this was, uh, it was very interesting for a while, but then I could do the job in my sleep. But on the other hand, I was a mother and I wanted to, you know, I didn't want to drive myself crazy. My husband was very busy with what he was doing. And so um, one of the people I was working with uh, said, I'm applying to get a grant at the Sloan Foundation. Will you come with me and give a talk? So at that point, I was an expert on biotech in New York City. And I remember one politician saying to me, is that the hand cream factory in the Bronx? I said, well, no, actually, that's not quite biotech. And so on, because <laughs> I never knew who I was going to be talking to. Right. So right. anyway, um, we, but the woman who was applying, she had been the head of um, Health and Hospitals Corporation on the Mayor Giuliani administration. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about someone who's very accomplished. Mm -hmm. And she was nervous. And so I was like, okay, I better look at this. And just, uh, the Sloan Foundation, it looked really interesting. So I worked hard on my talk. Now, the other thing that was very interesting about this opportunity to help her give a talk with her at the Sloan Foundation was the Sloan Foundation, for any speaker, requires their resume. So oh. she's like, Paul, I need you to send your resume. So like, I just, whatever is in the computer, just sent it right over and so on. So I. I had done my homework on the people. It was very interesting, but I didn't know who I was talking with uh, because they didn't really introduce themselves. Uh -huh. And so that's fine. But I ended up, I was, turns out I was talking a lot to the president of the Sloan Foundation. And then again, this is just after I've given this somewhat of a bland talk, but explaining what I did. So two days later, I get a call back. And they say, thanks for giving your talk. Now, I'm not, it's, I'm not applying for the grant. I'm like the, the backup speaker. And they said, would you consider applying for a job here? I said, I'm not looking for a job, but I'll come talk to you. So two weeks later, I show up, and I talk to the guy, uh, one of the program directors. And one of the things he said, well, I said, you know, I really don't want to work full time. He said, well, we, we have a program that says professionals can work part time. So like they can? That's, and that's so, so forward thinking. Oh, no. It, so anyway, so suddenly I'm like, OK. So. Um, he said, but, you know, we're really far in the search, and so if you want the job, if you want to apply for the job, you have to do it tomorrow. Well, they already had my resume, okay, right. so I can't, like, adjust it or interpret it, so all I could do is write a cover letter. So I stay up all night with my husband, what, are, what am I saying, the cover letter, I send it in, and nothing happens. However, hmm. I didn't realize things were really quiet at that point at the foundation. Oh. About a, um, just before I'm getting ready to go on a vacation, I get a call. Oh, we need to schedule, you know, we want to bring you in for an interview. And I'm like, oh, no, I'm going on a vacation. This and whatever. And I had two interviews there. The president called me up and said, Paula, we'd like you to come work here. I said, and I just, I walked through the door. I just, it was so interesting. And I thought I was going to be uh, directing a new scientific program in biotechnology. Mm -hmm. And then on my first day at the office, my boss said, Paula, how'd you like to work in bioterrorism? I said, I'd love to. But I said, but what do I do? He said, I said, do I have to give out you know, grants every quarter? Do I he said, oh, no, no, don't worry about that. He said, you know, we just funded some people to work in this area. Go study what they're doing and go study and tell me if there's anything we should do. So what's What a lovely thing for somebody to say to you, go study. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but what's interesting, and it's applicable to sort of, sort of this whole, the problems with Ebola right now, is one of my first grants in that program in, in 2000, so this is before we've had you know, terrorist attacks or um, the anthrax incidents, mm -hmm. was to look at the laws around quarantine. Uh, the last time laws and quarantine had been updated was around the 1918 flu. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, we had, didn't have any widespread epidemics. Right. So, and all sorts of other laws had been updated in the, you know, in the interregnum. nine. So this was my first grant. And I still remember I'm sitting there, because we, we negotiate, we invite them, and you're pretty much going to get them, but you have to do the, you have to get through our process, and right. some people don't make it through. But sitting there, and my boss said to these two professors, very distinguished professors, said, uh, they say, oh, it's going to take them. It's a three-year process to come up with the, the legal terminology. And he said, you know, well, what, w what would it take, you know, if something happened? So they said, oh, we could do it in a year. Okay, so we give them the grant, and then we have September 11th and anthrax. Right. They wrote it in six weeks. 
Wow. And every so and that model legislation was then used by all 50 states as it, it just to see as a checklist did they have things so anyway. So unfortunately we have problems you know, these are very small problems we have right now with Ebola, but in terms of the different states' laws around isolation and quarantine mm -hmm. and health powers, uh, can you trace back to that? my work? Yeah. Nice girl from Stoughton. Excellent. Another project. Uh, and you got an opportunity to speak to uh, three quarters of our high school today, because that's what uh, the amount that will fit in the auditorium. So the 10th, 11th, and 12th graders were there. Uh, but there'll be other folks who'll be able to see this who weren't there and also children who are not yet in high school. So given that you uh, have been through our school system and then have had a very successful life and career, um, do you have any uh, brief advice that you would give to young children now who are maybe beginning to think about these things or maybe haven't even thought about these things? Well, I think I have a few things to say on this. One is pursue things that are interesting and that you enjoy, like really follow your passion. <laughs> Because you don't know where that will lead. But if you're passionate about something, often you become very good at it. And that will help yeah. things. But sort of when I was, pre when I was preparing re my remarks for this uh, presentation this morning, I, I realized there were three things that really helped me. One is perseverance, mm -hmm. just really st staying with a, with a problem or a course or mm -hmm. whatever, and really just trying to just to stick with it and Sooner or later, you'll make some progress. Um, the next uh, item is hard work. And by that I mean, it's not necessarily endless hours of work, but really focused, like really tackling a problem. Mm -hmm. um, just, you have to you know, spend time on it. You have to work on it. And then the third thing uh, that has been really helpful to me is being open. And because there are all sorts of things out there that I didn't know about when I went to Stony right. High School. I mean, would I dream that one of my college roommates would become the ambassador to Ecuador? And oh, wait, I should have put the, I'm sorry I didn't put oh. the picture <laughs> in my, my, but we went and visited her and there's a picture of me and um, her at the ambassador's residence, you know, with the oh, flags. Nice. Yeah. And, it, uh, and it was really a, uh, it was really a lot of fun. So. So that's know. good. So people can, um, and think a little bit about that. We actually, uh, in elementary and middle school, make the, we try and teach our kids that the, um, you may or may not have certain kinds of talent and really, whether you do or you don't, it's the effort and perseverance that you put in that's going to determine where you go, not really what you start with. Exactly. Because I you can start more. with a great deal of talent, and if you don't develop it, it's not really going to go anywhere. And you can be not so great at things, and still, I mean, some of the the greatest politicians or entrepreneurs or, or well, I'm or not the world's greatest are, scientist. Okay, that I. But I, but as a scientist, in the work that I'm doing, I am doing great work. Yes, and you get to do great things if you if you persevere and work at them. Exactly. So. And we don't all know what the world has to offer. So being open to new things that come, that's oh, it's very, very, very important. important. Yes. So what do you anticipate is going to be the next stage of your career? Well, I, I think I've made a point all day about how much I love chemistry. And when I joined the foundation, I, I really wanted to start a program in chemistry. I would, and so here it is 14 years later. I just last year um, started a program which I'm now calling the chemistry of the human habitat. Just mm. I've been studying sort of the microbes in the room and the buildings and the people. And I realized that the microbes emit uh, volatile organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay. So some of the grantees started studying that. But then I realized that the room is, uh, is even more interesting chemically because we have all these modern materials, and they'll be very modern at the new high school, right. that again, uh, things are lighter, mm -hmm. but again, what it's new chemistry indoors. Right. We know that people spend 23 hours a day indoors, so the people, are, there are, we know that the ozone concentration in rooms drops when people are in there, because ozone actually reacts with the squalene on your skin. And this is, wow, these are things yes. that are happening. We right. have a very different light spectrum. So outdoors, you have the natural light spectrum. So mm -hmm. sunlight does certain things. But indoors, you have different light. And so the, so the chemistry, so we have chemicals, 
in chemistry, you have a lot of surface area, you yes. have different, so the surface to volume ratio indoors is totally different than outdoors. So the sure. way I'm starting the program is finding brilliant chemists who are studying atmospheric chemistry and moving them indoors. Bringing them inside to the environment in which we arguably spend much, much more time now. Exactly. Right, so, so the interaction between us and it and the impact of it on us is something we've just right. barely begun to think about. And then maybe we would, but it can, just as similar to my microbiology of the built environment program, if we study these areas, we might make different choices how we design, build, Absolutely. and operate buildings. Does cleaning yes. clean? Right. <laughs> I, am, exactly. I, I gave a grant to actually do, examine that with the microbial profile. So yes. I don't do you just yet. move things around? Right, 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 yeah. Well, I would really like to thank you for coming and taking time out of your busy schedule to come back to Stoughton to share your experiences with it our was an students honor. here. I really appreciate it. I'm proud to be a graduate of Stoughton High School. I'm truly honored to be a member of the Hall of Fame for extraordinary achievement. Great, thank you. Thank you. So for those of you who are living in Stoughton now, you can come into the lobby of our superintendent's office and you will see Paula's plaque in the Hall of Fame along with the others who have graduated and been inducted uh, before today. So thank you so much oh, for coming. Oh, thank you so it's much, Dr. Rizzi. It's been a pleasure. Right. Bye now.